Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to see you all. And for all of our friends online, it's, it's fitting in the gospel text today and even in the imagery that you see in our slides, that you see the world. And so people are coming from all over the world to join us from different places. And we're coming together as one body. That's really fitting, I think. The message today brings us into this prayer. It's called the high priestly prayer. And in some ways, you know the Lord's Prayer, because we say that every week. In some ways, it mirrors elements of the Lord's Prayer, the high priestly prayer that Jesus prays for his disciples. And I want you to know that he prays that prayer for you as well. So this is a pivotal time in our church season where we stand on the edge, the end of the season we call Easter, that ends today. And and next Sunday, we celebrate the festival of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection Easter, in the season of Easter, 40 days, Jesus appeared to his disciples, and then he departed for 10 days until he appeared to them, the Holy Spirit, on Pentecost. So we're right in the transition. This last Thursday was a day called the Ascension. That's what Anna was talking about when Jesus ascended into heaven after he left his disciples. Wait for me in Jerusalem, they did, and then they received the Holy Spirit. You see a culmination of all these things coming together, and now we're closing out the season of Easter. So watch what we do in this reading today. As we close out the season of Easter, we're we're jumping back to before Jesus was executed on the cross. When he was in that upper room having this last meal, this last supper with his disciples. I think that's important to note as we close Easter, as we reflect back. Think about the disciples in that room with Jesus. They knew not what they would face. The trouble, the hardship, the persecution, the failure, the doubt, the worry, the fear. That for them was their desert. So Jesus, before he departed, on that last night, he shares these words. This was his last prayer, you know, these last moments with his disciples like that, before he departed to the Garden of Gethsemane. So in his last words, what did he do? He prayed for them. And he prayed for you because he knew that he was leaving them in the world. Just like he puts us in the world. You're in the world. He says that we're in the world, but not of the world. We're kind of like foreigners or aliens. Some of you know what that's like to move to a different place and be alien or foreign. So he's saying we're like that. We're like alien to this world. We're in it, but we're not of it. Jesus prays for them and he prays for you. And this is what was happening on that very night. Jesus was sharing these last words. So you know they're important. He knew that they would feel alone. Consider this. When they see Jesus go to the cross, when they see that he dies in those three days, it's it's perhaps like the most alone and broken that they had ever, ever felt. So... Jesus prays for them. So he's praying for you too, so that when you're in those desert places, when you're feeling totally isolated, alone, maybe you come here today feeling that way, feeling really alone. And and Jesus prays for you. Jesus prays for you. So while you're in the world, he's strengthening you with his word with his presence. And we're going to talk about what that means. I wanted to share with you because Pastor Johnson and I just got back, just on Friday, we got back from a a trip to the Grand Canyon. It it was not the intention to go to the Grand Canyon. We went to a conference that was in Arizona that put us close to the Grand Canyon. And we went, we took a day to go and see the Grand Canyon. I had never seen it before. It was amazing. Maybe you can tell a picture. It was beautiful. Pastor Johnson and I had no idea what we were getting ourselves into because we found a trail 
and armed only with a water bottle and some dress shoes Pastor Johnson had on, we ventured down this trail, down into the canyon, a mile and a half down. It seemed like 10 miles down. (laughs) Going down, however, was exciting and fun. We found that ascending or coming back up was a lot harder. This took us quite a few hours, but we enjoyed being out in the heat of the day, seeing the beauty of God's creation. As we were hiking down, we met some fellow hikers and a husband and wife who had hiked that trail before, so they knew what to expect. And one of their observations, as we kind of shared uh, little bits and pieces about ourselves and we learned about them, is that uh, Chris, the husband, said, this is like God's cathedral. The Grand Canyon, how beautiful it is. And and it is an amazing part of God's creation, part of the world. You see, the world is God's good creation. It's good, and he loves it. And he wants to redeem and, and restore it. So as we were hiking down, though, and we heard that God's cathedral, that stuck with us, that really sort of continued to ring in our minds that idea. As we looked and we observed, we saw the power of simple stream, river, and water. As the streams and river could carve out channels, could cut through rocks. And I want to use that image today. That of a stream of living water. That is of a stream of water that's flowing in the desert. That is flowing in your desert. When you feel alone or in those dry places, Jesus is saying in this prayer today, he's like that stream of water that flows, that brings life. So our conference then, as we attended, we went for the conference. We enjoyed a little quick respite in a day of adventure. But our conference was called the Two Text Conference where we were looking academically at the Word of God, at the text, at the Bible, at the original text, original languages, and trying to delve in academically deep into the Word of God to look for our understanding or interpretation of word and words. That's the one text. The second text that we were studying and discussing is the text of the culture, of the world, of the context. Two texts academically approaching the word and then applying the word of God to the culture of today, these two texts. Really, that was a summation, I think, of this concept that we are both in the world and of the world. God places you in the world and he includes you. Jesus had a mission and he gives to each of you a mission in the world in the context of where he's placed you. In the demographics, in the geography, God has, that's the second text. How do we delve into the world as Jesus has sent us into the world? So this conference was really a great exploration of that, where we're looking at how does God use all different types of people that maybe we're not used to in our church body? How does God use people of different colors and ethnicities and backgrounds and male and female? How does God have a purpose and intention for all people to delve into his work? This prayer was not just for some. This prayer, this unity prayer that Jesus has was for all who would believe. He gives us all this mission. Two text conference. It was at Grand Canyon University and we had a great time. We're a little bit tired still, however. I looked at this text today that you heard Eunice read, and I took all the words and I placed it into a a Wordle diagram, and it maps the reoccurrence of words so that you see the words that are used the most are the largest on the screen. So in these nine verses, we see that the world, you see that's the biggest word, that shows up most frequently in this text. This text is not just a text, it's a prayer, Jesus' prayer. So in in Jesus' prayer, he's referencing the world. Second to that is truth and word. You see other words as well, like joy and consecration, guarded, scripture. 
These are all elements of Jesus' prayer for you. But you notice that the world takes a big role in this prayer. Now, here's the thing. Jesus is praying for us, for you, to be in the world. We, we may want for Jesus to pray for us to be prosperous in the world. Right? Let's be honest. Or maybe we want for him to guard us. And he does want to, he says he'll guard us from the evil one or guard us from evil. We like that, guarding from evil. We like the idea of Jesus praying for our prosperity and for our stuff and for the advancement of self. But that's not what Jesus is praying for. He's praying that you're guarded from evil so that you can be part of his mission in the world. That you can be a witness of him and the hope that you have in him in the world. So our prayers sometimes don't always line up because our prayers, we want prosperity and that's not a bad thing. We want stuff, we want advancement, we want all of these things, but Jesus is praying for these things that have eternal value and he wants for us to value them as well. So he says that he's going to sanctify us in his truth. He's calling you on a mission. So what does he include in this prayer? What's on his prayer list? These are the things that I, as I looked at it, he's praying for unity and joy. He's praying for that you would be in the world, but not of the world. He's praying that you're guarded from evil, that you you would be on mission and that you're empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is a very mission oriented prayer that Jesus is praying for you. Jesus loves you so much that he wants to include you on the mission that he has in this world. So here's how our text begin. Jesus said, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given to me, that they may be one even as we are one. He expresses the unity that he has. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He wants for all Christians to be one. Isn't that amazing? And that was really the summation of our two text conference too, is how can God use the full measure of God's people together to do more in the world? But sometimes we're not always so good at getting along, are we? Even in our own church body, sometimes we're not always so good at getting along. And yet Jesus prays for it. He prays for it. That all Christians, all believers would be united and one in the oneness that he shares with the Father. That's a beautiful prayer and a great picture for us of his desire. Is not that we disconnect ourselves from the world, not that we disconnect ourselves from other brothers and sisters in the faith, but that we are united together in his mission. I saw a, a brief illustration of this. While we were there, Pastor Johnson was, he was so wanting to visit some friends that he had made in Phoenix, Arizona. That's Carol and Rod. They're retired. Are they in their 70s, 80s? Somewhere in that range. And uh, Pastor Johnson had met them while he was attending a conference in Phoenix, Arizona years ago while he was riding a shuttle bus to and from the conference. Rod was a volunteer shuttle bus driver. His wife, Carol, used to work for the church as the church secretary years ago. Rod was driving Pastor Johnson back and forth, and believe it or not, Pastor Johnson's pretty talkative. So he started a conversation with Rod, and they talked every day during that conference. And the next year, uh, they became friends. The next year, they invited Pastor Johnson to stay in their home. And every year following, and I thought, isn't that just amazing that in just strangers that God can unite together? What were they unified in? In their faith in Jesus Christ. They come from very bit different backgrounds, very different contexts, and yet they became brothers and sisters. Even spending time together, living together. A beautiful illustration. So we got to see them, stop by and talk to them. And they were, I think they were quite disappointed that we didn't stay with them this last time. But because of circumstance, we weren't able to do that. So 
Uh, what a great illustration of the unity that Jesus prayed for. That's just one of so many. Our church is a great example of that as well. The unity that God intends. Now, here's how it continues. Jesus says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So we are in the world and yet we're not of the world. It makes us kind of like foreigners or aliens. The gospel here, Jesus's words, call us into this countercultural lifestyle. Where in the, in the world, the world often meets things that are different with opposition or hatred or rejection. But as brothers and sisters, as ones that Jesus prayed for, we meet people in love. When the world holds things against others, we provide forgiveness. When the world seeks self, we lift others up. Do you see the countercultural nature of the gospel? Jesus is acknowledging that in the world we will experience hatred. But we are not of the world. We are not of that. We are in the world to be salt and light, to be different in the world. So that people, when they see us, they see a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven. They see a glimpse of what Jesus is. But how? The question is, but how? How do we do that? Just work harder, be better, make less mistakes. No. How do we do that? We cannot do that on our own. We need God's help. And this is part of his prayer. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So often there's this notion that in the church, we need to abstract ourselves, you know, in the sake of purity, we need to abstract ourselves from the world. And for some people, maybe that works, you know, to go to a mountaintop and devote their life to prayer. But God wants you in the world so that you can love and serve others. He wants you to be in those places where darkness reigns so that you can bring light. There's obviously a challenge in that. How do we do that without being corrupted by darkness? And yet Jesus says, I'm going to pray for you that the evil one will not have power over you, that I will guard and keep you from evil. So Jesus is talking to us about how do we engage in life in the world? With his presence, he wants us to be in the world. We got to thinking about this, Pastor Johnson and I, contextualizing this to our location. When we were in Phoenix, it was really hot. It got up to over 100 degrees. And they said, hey, 100 is not so bad. When it gets 115, that starts feeling a little bit warm. I'm thinking, wow, that's not for me. But it was pretty warm. And all around us, as we were driving through Phoenix and outside of Phoenix, cactuses were everywhere. There are sororos, some kind of a certain kind of cactus. I can't, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Beautiful. I loved them. But what was interesting as I looked at them, they were all over the place, but they sort of just stood there like people all alone, you know, very rigid and and straight. They might, you know, in like a traditional where they might fit in well with us Lutherans, very stoic, you know, not with us. But but they stood there all alone. And and yet there was so many of them standing there all alone in the desert, right in the middle of the desert. And I thought, you know, gosh, this really, as we discussed it, really fits with our Christian life. That we can feel like we're in the desert places. We can feel like we're all alone. And we might fail to recognize that all around us are a cloud of witnesses. All around us are our context in which Jesus has placed us to do his work. So in the desert, the temptation of the evil one... Or Jesus' prayer to guard us from evil. You see, evil leads us to a place where we do feel, where we turn in on self. And we do feel like we're all alone. You've been there. Maybe you fluctuate between that. Maybe you feel that right now, where you feel like you're all alone. Jesus is praying for you. He doesn't want you to feel that way. You see, our sin, that, that sin in us 
and the world that stirs around us wants you to feel like you are isolated, that no one cares, that you're alone. And that kind of what, what the desert reminds us of. But I want to show you this next picture. It's a little video clip. It's short. Uh, I'll just, while it's playing, no, it's peaceful. We found a stream off the road, off the desert, and we went from desert landscape to beautiful stream. And do you see all that life around the stream? Beautiful, right? We stood in the stream. It was cold. We could see to the bottom. It was clear. It was fresh. It felt so refreshing. And that is in this prayer, that is Jesus when he's saying he's sanctifying us in the truth. This is like him bringing a stream in the desert. We were reading from this stream from Isaiah 35 of the stream in the desert, how Jesus is that stream that brings us life. And all around it creates life. So when we are alone, when we feel in that desert, Jesus is like the stream. So the how is answered in this prayer when Jesus says that he brings us into his word of truth. Coming into God's word is like returning to that stream or standing in that stream in the heat of the desert. But so often people want to bring themselves out of the stream, out into the desert, where we find ourselves dry and thirsty for the word of God. Because other things push it to the side in our lives. And yet Jesus wants to bring you to the stream of living water. He wants to refresh you through his word this day. So our text, as it wraps up, it says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. That's the stream, people. That's the stream of water in the desert for you. So whatever desert you face, Jesus wants to bring you into that stream of truth, of his word. He wants to refresh you and to answer the question. That question that we have, am I alone? Jesus prays for us so that we don't ever feel alone. He prays for us so that we're in the darkest moment. We know that he has purpose for us and that he's with us. And he puts us in the world empowered with this word so that we can be witness. And he says this, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Jesus has sent you into the world, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus sends you to be witnesses, to extend that stream of water, that living water, that word, the means of grace by which God works as he works through baptism and the Lord's Supper. You see, it's that stream that keeps flowing to each of you. And he wants to send each of you into the world. The world is most certainly a focus here in the text today. Because Jesus knows that you're in it. You're in the world and yet you have a hope in him. So you're not of the world. You have his truth. You have his stream of living water. And so now he sends you into the world to be his witnesses. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word today, this word that sanctifies us in the truth. Lord, we pray that you would reign present in our light, that you would be like a stream of living water that flows to us in our very dry places. When we feel alone or isolated, Lord, that you refresh us, that you remind us that you pray for us, that we matter to you, and that you have an intention and purpose, that you join us in this mission. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.